the theme of tonight's uh, panel is the cartoonist in comics. Um, all four of the cartoonists here have worked uh, either autobiographically or semi-autobiographically in which they've totally injected themselves in their work. Um, the, uh, I consider him uh, one of the kings of semi-autobio. He's a gentleman in the black t-shirt right here, Dean Haspiel. Please give him a round of applause. Um, old Dino here, other than being infamous for taking off his shirt in public periodically, um, has actually uh, grown up in comics, uh, first starting as an assistant for Howard Chaikin and Walter Simonson uh, and Bill Sienkiewicz. Um, back in 10 years ago, was it? 1985. Oh, 1985. Yes, I, I think so. Is it Can feedbacking? No, this is not. No, it's not on? Okay. Here you go, Dino. They're, they're all on. 1985. <laughs> that was his imitation of God. Um, all right, so anyways, Dino has done not only his own work through uh, Opposable Thumbs, um, which was straight autobio, but he's also done his avatar, Billy Dogma, who we'll touch on today, um, who's basically the universal truths that Dean lives through every day, told in a Jack Kirby-inspired slash noirish. You know, we'll, we'll get into that. Um, he's also done Street Code, which is heavily autobiographical slash semi, and has also drawn American Splendor for Harvey P. Carr, and currently is one of the wranglers of TripCity.net. Um, next up, it's a lovely Laura Lee Gulledge. Um, please give her a round of applause. Her first graphic novel, first graphic novel won, it, it got how many nominations? It, it was like ridiculous. It got an Eisner nom, it got a Harvey nomination, which for anyone who's into comics is a big deal. And it was her first graphic novel, and she just decided to do comics all of a sudden. And it's amazing, page by page. Heavily semi-autobiographical. Her next one, Will and Wit, is due out May 7th, and we're gonna show you a preview of that. So everyone, please give cartoonist slash performance artist slash, there are a lot of just the slashes. Know. Yeah, so please give her a hand. First up is, uh, next up is Bob Fingerman. Um, I was introduced to Bob's work through Cracked Magazine, actually, in the 1980s. Um, he's since gone on to do bigger things, uh, not only as a cartoonist with Minimum Wage, his semi-autobiographical series, um, but also his speculative memoir, From the Ashes, um, and has been a novelist with uh, Pariah and Bottom Feeder. So please give Bob a huge hand. And last, but definitely not least, is uh, Ethan Young, right here on the end. Um, I had the honor of uh, editing Ethan's webcomic Tales into a graphic novel form. It's volume one of three. Uh, he's been doing Tales for how long, Ethan? Um, some version or another for like 10 years, so most of my years. adult life. That's commitment, isn't it? Uh, so anyways, Tales is a semi-autobiographical strip um, that involves, all, it involves a lot of cats. Too many. Too many, and fantasy, and superhero action, and romance, and tr it's amazing stuff. But I'm biased, I edited the guy. So hmm. please give Ethan a big round of applause. So now is to um, introduce you to the cartoonists uh, here with you in their work. Uh, each of them is going to do a quick reading. Uh, for Dean, we actually have um, an exa a sample from Street Code his Zuda comic story that he did for DC Comics um, online strips. Go for it, Dean. Okay, so I did a um, this series called Street Code that Chris just talked about, and uh, I think there are about 12 or 14 short stories that are knit together. Uh, and hopefully I would like to put it out in print, actually, but it is a digital comic right now at DC Digital. Um, I think it's a six-issue series, and each issue has like two or three different stories, and this is one of them. Um, so I'll just read it. Maybe it's because I look ornery, or maybe I look like the kind of guy who could rob somebody. Whatever. It was a nice day to shoot a movie, and my old college film classmate, Saul, asked me to act like a thief in his film, Sabotaged. The location was set in Dumbo, down under Manhattan Brooklyn overpass, 
and I was to wear all black and steal a purse from a lady and get busted by a superhero. Simple enough. The way we rehearsed it was, Saul's mom starts walking, and I come rushing out of nowhere and snatch her purse. Suddenly, a superhero dressed in full cape and mask costume comes after me and shouts, Stop, thief! Which, as directed, prompts me to flash him the hairy eyeball before running down the block and off camera. Saul's catalytic siren of action launches his mother's oblivious dawdling, which prompts my stealthy descent as I grab her purse and sprint down the block. The superhero screams, car! And I turn my face toward him to sneer, thinking he said, stop, thief, when suddenly, a four-wheeled metal monster comes ramming into me, full throttle, practically crushing my legs into a building. I try to halt my ascent and instead smash my entire left side into the back of the vehicle, flipping over its hood and crashing into the sidewalk below. Within seconds, I stood up in shock, completely confused. Where had the car come from? Why did it run into me? This wasn't in the rehearsal. I was reeling. Everybody came rushing to my aid as I stumbled, feeling the pain compete with my adrenaline rush, seizing my muscles. The driver, a dirty blonde bohemian, had the look of fear in his big black eyes. He thought I was actually snatching the poor lady's purse, mistaking me for a real thief, and went Batman on me with his hatchback. <laughs> but he claimed that a criminal had stolen some lady's purse the week before and figured I was the culprit never once noticing a camera crew or a life-size superhero chasing after me. Two days to fully consider his vigilante act, I was seeing stars and playing medic on myself. Ouch. My left thigh was smarting from the punch of the car and my foot was burning from blue flames of pain. My left wrist and forearm was giving me the most trouble as molten hot splinters raked at my tendons. Ligaments screamed from nuggets of napalm, and my head was dizzy from nausea. Faculties compromised, I played macho and set the bohemian Batman free. Stop, thief! Saul exhaled with relief, but needed a final take, a reverse angle. Ow! And my adrenaline reserve was tapped after I gave him what he needed to complete the scene, and the sunny day turned gray and it started to rain. I was driven back to my apartment to lick sore wounds and attempt some freelance work, but the damage began to seep in. My health insurance plan consisted of wonton soup, regular visits to the Russian Turkish bathhouse, and a pint of ice cream. But I could hardly make it to my corner deli for a bottle of aspirin. Hollywood had different plans for me. Thank you. So next up is a preview of Laura Lee's next graphic novel, Will and Wit, uh, which I've been lucky enough to read, and it's absolutely amazing. I'm not saying it because she's right next to me and could beat me up if I said otherwise. Uh, Bruce Easy. Um, I so can't follow Dean. He has come the on, voice. Come on, you can follow Dean. You can do it. <laughs> so are you ready? Can you handle it? I think Are the first good? page will be rather easy to read. <laughs> um, to put it in context, this is in the middle of the graphic novel um, in which the, there are a bunch of teenagers and they're part, helping put on an arts carnival because there's a big blackout because the hurricane knocked out the power. So all the kids have come together to put together an uh, arts carnival in this old warehouse, which is very inspired by, well, it's actually set in Charlottesville, Virginia. Hey. <laughs> Oh, and the motif in it is that the main character who's scared of the dark, her shadows are alive, so that's why there's the stippled hand in the top right corner. It's like, ooh, creepy, darkness. Um, <laughs> so, do, 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 do. Oh, my. Do, 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 do. <laughs> that's circus music. <laughs> okay. And these are her silly friends, Reese and Autumn and Ol. Thank God you're back. Autumn's folding, like a card table. Am not. 
Can you tell her to stop freaking out? She's freaking me out. I'm just nervous, that's all. Autumn is putting on a puppet show. Autumn, you're a goddess. You'll be amazing. Just enjoy it. Breathe. Yeah, I mean, if you can navigate a river on an air mattress, you can put on a little puppet show. Really, what's the worst thing that can happen? I can forget my cues, fall down, break my leg, get my period, and vomit all at the same time? <laughs> well, the odds of that happening are as unlikely as, I don't know, the roof caving in? <laughs> That's not helping. Oh, hey, look, it's Noel. Hi, Noel, it's Noel, hi. Why, hello, my carny friends. Oh, your eyes, they're back to normal. She was wearing blue contacts previously. <laughs> oh, yeah, they're, they're back to just boring old brown. No, they're not boring. They're, um, I mean, I just wanted to wish you good luck. Uh, uh. Oh, blue M&Ms, thanks. And Reese's Pieces, because her name is Reese. Uh, well, break a leg. I'm sure you two will bring down the house. Wah, wah. <laughs> We've got to finish setting up. Yeah, we'll see you two in there. What did I do wrong? I know, girls. Come on, Eeyore. Let's cheer you up. OK. Tonight will be great. I can feel it. Surprises await. Right, surprises, because those always go my way. And this is my fault. I didn't arrange these in proper order. So, so Bob, we're going to skip over you for a sec to get to Ethan. <laughs> I'm so sorry. It is nothing personal. Take um, that, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely not. Bob's going to kill me. Um, OK. No, no age before beauty here. <laughs> <laughs> so um, Ethan's, this is a sample from Tales Volume 1 with the main character <laughs> named Ethan. Uh, yeah, please excuse the fact that it looks, as my wife reminds me all the time, it looks nothing like me. Um, and uh, just a little um, background on this. It's a scene that takes place after I break up with um, a very important girlfriend who was Chinese. And um, of course, once you start dating a non-Chinese girl, your mom all of a sudden thinks that that ex-girlfriend is the daughter-in-law of her dreams. <laughs> so um, oh, here it goes. Also, uh, in real life, this conversation took place in Cantonese, hence the bluntness. Um, try, and call, try and call Cynthia again, son. Mom, I tried texting her last week. No response. If she wants to call, she will call. Well, it would make me very happy. You don't want your mom to be sad, do you? I thought you never even liked Cynthia. Nonsense. I was just concerned when you started dating. You were both so young. Well, three years went by, and we didn't need a single abortion. Don't speak that way. Sorry. Uh, I did talk that way, too. Um, what about the cats, son? They're her responsibility, too. Oh, why do you like those cats so much? Because they don't ask a million questions. Can we talk about something else, Mom? Have you called Patrick lately? Uh, you two used to be so close. I remember when the two of you would spend the entire summer just drawing and drawing. Mom, that's because you wouldn't let us out of the apartment. Well, look at where we used to live. Remember all the gangsters just, that would just hang around Chinatown? You should be thanking me, son. I kept you boys safe. I kept you boys from being mugged. Her way, we kept our food stamps safe. And then my mom gives a look of disapproval. <laughs> Okay, so next up is Bob, and Bob, will you be reading from Pariah? <clears throat> All right, well, here's the thing. Is this thing on or not on? I think it's on. Yeah, it's on. All right. Hot mic. Um, I was going to read from Pariah, but, you know, we're here for comics, so I had two kind of dark things to read, and I thought what I would read to keep in the comics theme, but it will have no visual accompaniment, is the beginning of the script which is actually bonus material in the new... Did, did anyone here ever read the uh, comic series I did called Minimum Wage? Ooh. Okay. Oh. All right. Um, well, I wrote a, an 11th issue. I just never drew it. That, at that point, I stopped doing it. So as some of the uh, bonus material in this new edition, I have the script for that undrawn issue. So I figured I'd read this because nobody's ever heard it. Uh, so as a little setup, our main character, Rob, he is a cartoonist, but he wrote a column reviewing other people's smutty comics for a porn rag he works for. <laughs> and he has uh, quit writing that column, but he still hangs out at the office because he's uh, still friendly with the staff. So anyway, here we go. Oh, and, and this basically 
Good reviews are, are nice. I've been very fortunate to have mostly good reviews, but the bad ones stay with you forever. And uh, this is Rob's first time being reviewed, and he's reviewed in his old column. So by a new columnist. All right, Rob is holding the new copy of Pork. Pork was, Pork's the fictionalized version of Screw, which is a rag I used to work for. Uh, holding the new copy of Pork, waving it angrily at Ken, the art director. Ken looks uncomfortable as Rob Rant sulks. Elvis, who is his extremely corpulent uh, former editor, is in the background smirking. Caption, Wednesday, August 25th, side note, my birthday, uh, 4.45 p.m., Rob. This is perfect, just when I needed to leaven my spirits. Ken, people get bad reviews, it happens. Rob, yeah, but who is this bitch to get uppity on my ass in my old column? Elvis, he can dish it out, but he can't take it. Oh, the irony is too much for me to bear. Rob, yeah, yeah, very amusing. I suppose it is a little karma coming back to me, but geez, my own column. Elvis, the very same. See what happens when you leave the fold to pursue your folly elsewhere? A young Turk comes in, takes your place, and buries you. Rob, buries? Who is she, Khrushchev? She writes like she's from Kalinikov Kalinovka. It's off topic, half the column. Her syntax stinks, and frankly, who cares who she hangs out with and that she can't hold her liquor? Oh, and in between the scintillatingly self-absorbed tidbits, she managed to shred my work. Kudos. Fuck, this is really bothering me. Elvis, really? You mask your feelings so elegantly one would hardly notice. <laughs> Rob, in my own column. Jesus, Elvis, the least you could have done was retire the column title and give it a new one, something like On the Rag or The Vapid Twat. <laughs> Elvis, I wanted to retire your column title. I never liked it, but the head Buana insisted we keep it for continuity. He thinks it's clever. I always thought it was stupid. Rob, you thought it was stupid because Brian came up with it. Brian's an editor who's also moved on. Uh, Elvis, regardless, the bitter bee of irony has left its stinger in your tuchus. Rob, ever the poet, I tell you, this place has gone to the dog since Brian left. I wouldn't have gotten slammed in my old column if he were here to watch my back. Elvis, stop being such a pussy, Rob. It's a bad review, the first of many to come. All the artistes suffer the slings and arrows of fickle tastemakers, plus the new crit, crit is a cute little blonde. Rob, so am I. <laughs> <laughs> Rob, anyway, I guess now I'm regretting quitting my column. Sure, the money sucked, but at least, Elvis, at least you knew your work would never get bad ink here. Rob, right, eh, what do I care? I do care, it's irrational, why should I care? Elvis, could you go sulk somewhere else? I've got work to do, go home, Rob. Go home and hate fuck your new wife. <laughs> Fantas <laughs> fantasize she's the chick who gave you the bad review, it'll make the fucking better. <laughs> Rob, that's sick, I hope you're joking, hate fuck, grief. Cut to Rob now at home with Sylvia, his new wife, reading the pork, <laughs> looking disgusted. Caption, 6.52 p.m., Sylvia. So she's an asshole. You can't let it get to you. You wrote some harsh stuff in the past, and now you're feeling the karmic sting. Rob, thanks for the wisdom. That's basically what Fatty said. <laughs> Sylvia, Rob, people get bad reviews. If it was for something that had meaning to you, I'd really get behind you, but it was a collection of porno strips. Rob, but they were my porno strips. Mine, ah, what would you know about it? Sylvia, excuse me? Rob, that came out surlier than I meant, but I mean, you've never put your work out for public consumption. Sylvia, I've got my nice little stash of rejection slips from poetry anthologies, what do you call that? Rob, not the same thing. That's private. A bad review is a public humiliation. Sylvia, so that makes my rejections less important? At least you get your stuff out there. Now you act all babyish if you get a bad review? It's a stupid porno comic reviewed in a disgusting porno rag that nobody but subhuman scum reads. <laughs> What's the diff? <laughs> Rob, so we go from weak consolation to outright hostility in about 60 seconds. Great, thank you. Sylvia, no, thank you. Maybe you got a bad review because the comic sucks. Ever think of that? Close on Rob's disbelieving face. What? Tell me I didn't hear what I just heard. 
Sylvia's up on her feast, feet now looking furious. Sylvia, there's nothing wrong with your ears, ba your ears, baby, just your comics. They're superficial, exploitative shit about big-titted bimbos. <laughs> That's some artistic legacy you're putting out there. Rob, this conversation's over. I'm going out for a while to cool off before this gets any uglier. Close on Sylvia. Oh, no, you don't. You're not walking out on me while we're in this. I put up with all your sexist shit because you can justify it with a paycheck, but I'm sick of those strips. I'm embarrassed. I can't show my family what you do. Rob, your family? Sexist? They're harmless strips. I make sure I don't exploit anyone more than anyone else. Jesus, don't make me have to defend my only well-paying work. Those big tits pay our rent. Rob, how long has this been festering away? It sounds like your whole spiel was prepared. Have you rehearsed this? The bad review was a sheer delight compared to this. I'm going out for a while. Real close on Sylvia's livid face. Sylvia, you leave and I'll, I'll tear up those fucking porno pages. I'll do it. Don't test me. Rob midway to the door, ba his back to Sylvia, who stands there panting. Rob, have you lost your fucking mind? You're threatening to destroy my originals? Sylvia, only if you walk out that door. Uh, OK, and then uh, it, the scene ends here. Uh, cut to uh, the interior of a local bar. Rob's with his best friend, Jack. Uh, Rob looks shaky. Jack looks baffled. Caption, 1239 AM, Jack. That's pretty fucked up. Rob, yeah, tell me about it. My staying only prolonged the argument for another hour. What did that achieve? OK, so now I really, really, really know how much Sylvia dislikes my porno strips. Hooray for me. I'm a winner. Jack, if you don't mind my asking, has she ever threatened you like this before? Rob, um, Jack, you have to think about it? Rob, sort of. We've had scraps before. Sometimes she gets very passionate about things. It gets very heated. She knows what buttons to push to get me to stay. Personally, I think walking away and clearing your head is a better alternative to screaming, but she's Italian. What can you do? <laughs> Jack, whatever, dude. Rob, yeah, whatever indeed. Thanks, Bob. Sorry if that was long. Oh, memoir. <laughs> yeah. But it was Tell damn funny. So. Damn funny. So, um, all right. So, <laughs> all of our cartoonists have done different levels of autobiography or semi autobiography. Um, I'd like to start with Laura Lee. And, and also, I would like to keep this kind of a round table discussion. Thank so, um, if any of you other guys want to chime in, uh, that would be fantastic. Um, you guys being the guys up here. Um, this, uh, tell me about this page, Laura Lee, from your Tupperware story. Well, I. Originally, I was making my work for like my own art therapy, and it was more illustration-y. Um, and then I, when I moved to New York is when I first read a graphic novel. I was like, oh my god, this is what I've been looking for. Because my work always had an implied narrative, but it was always more like a, a single panel showing a bigger scene. Um, so and I wanted to do sort of like a practice comic for uh, myself. And it was actually put up on uh, Activate through Dean. Like, yay, community. Um, and so I wrote it about growing up in Tupperware with my mom, because I sort of half hated and half loved it. And I was trying to understand. And the whole compartmentalized of it just sort of seemed to fit. Uh, so that was sort of like my trial run for doing a longer comic than just one page. So yeah. And it also has one of the fun. best, most obscure pop culture references ever with Erie, Indiana. Has anyone seen that? The Tupperware. Oh yeah. Do you know? Keeps them like, fresh forever. Two people exactly. Google it. All right. It's it's amazing. I, I didn't know anyone else knew that reference. Um, so how's your portrayal of you, the real you, the straight up, autobiographical you, different from the portrayal of you in page by page, which is your YA graphic novel? If you want to give us a little background on that too, that'd be great. Okay. Well, page by page is my first book, and. Um, Basically, I wanted to, if I had one story to, to get out there, because I used to be an art teacher, I wanted to make a story that would inspire other people to sort of get into the creative process like I did. And my in was just getting a sketchbook and starting to draw, which was great, but there were a lot of hurdles along the way. So I sort of wanted to uh, share my journey of that struggle to sort of find your own voice and how to share it with other people, because it's a very vulnerable process. Uh, so Paige is, she's like a, a part of my personality. She's like the quiet introvert side. 
because my stuff is auto bio and the way that each character is just like a different part of me. So there's little bits and pieces from different periods in here, but it's less taken directly from my life. Um, so yeah, and of course I just got bangs again. So now I look exactly like her because they all have red hair. It's like she has red hair and Will has like strawberry blonde, but they're black and white, so you can't tell. But in my head, they're all diff all my characters are the main characters are different, going to be different variations of redheads kind of just different sides of my personality. And so getting to know, and actually uh, part of me hated the fact that I was so shy about my work, so drawing about a really shy character sort of helped me deal with a, it was therapeutic in a way similar to my illustration work, but just in a different format, which focused, helped forced me to learn how to be more of a storyteller and, uh, I don't know, leaving more room for the audience, taking more risks. It was very scary. So. I guess it was sort of appropriate, you know, Paige. Well, I was terrified just like her. Speaking of your illustration work, I have uh, a great Oh, yeah, there's I one. I fell in love <laughs> with this piece. Um, how is your approach different from this to your comics work? Um, well, the illustration, they're all stylistically different, which has always gotten me in trouble, even though I always thought it was awesome to draw everything totally differently. <laughs> the idea of doing a comic, it was just hard to draw the same style consistently and the same character over and over because in my personal work everything I like to explore and you know one thing is collage one thing is representational one thing is more like an analytical cubist drawing depending on what I wanted to say so comics has sort of forced me to be a little less flaky about it just mm -hmm. pick one thing and just dive in instead of just hopping from one to the next to the next um, also if I may in page by page, uh, I thought Laura Lee was really intuitive for a comics newbie in that she really, where, where comics are where image is text too. And there's a lot of illustrations and images that were storytelling or, I mean, there's so much of that going on. I really felt, and even with the Tupperware story, how you compartmentalize and then the Tupperware becomes panels and stuff like that, you really exploited the form very well, I thought, and intuitively. I haven't seen the newest work except for the excerpt, but I was really impressed by, you know, someone who started out the gate, you know, uh, as a young cartoonist. Yeah, I'm actually really glad you bring that up because uh, one thing I did notice with both of these is um, because you come at this from a, an illustrative perspective, as in like an illustrator, um, as opposed to someone raised in the language of comics, have you found that that's freed you up more in terms of your storytelling? Uh, I think so. Because um, I always say that in art, it's easier to take risks if you're willing to drop the baby. Because the first time <laughs> I went to Europe, someone said, watch out for the gypsies. They'll throw like a baby at you. But it's not a baby. It's a sack of flowers. So someone tosses a baby at you. Drop the baby. Um, <laughs> sorry, that's really random. But I always think about that's that with awful. comics. <laughs> Well, you but know, it's a we are gypsy baby boy. stuff. I'm sorry. You know, this is back fun. in the 90s. Because yeah. um, when I came into comics, since um, I don't know, I, I was more a fine art background. So fine art was sort of like this precious baby, and I was I was too scared to take risks. But with comics, it was new to me. So it was like a playground. So I'd look at the format. Well, why do you have to have panels? So there's sections of the new book that have no panels. It's just trees, instead. Just I guess I, I like being, I like taking risks with the format because I'm not, it's, oh no, it's, I didn't grow up with it. So I just want to play with it because there are things I could do in comics that I can't do other places because I was always hitting walls. That's why I was so happy to find comics because I could bring in influences from, you know, photography and from illustration and all the other parts of my life, like event, you know, there's event production in this and installation and um, the main character makes lamps because I, you know, it's more like industrial design and so comics is, it was so much more flexible to me than other formats. So every page I approach is differently, like, well, yeah, this section wasn't as like zany. Yeah, and I feel like you don't fall into as many tropes because of that, which is something I see a lot of cartoonists do, is because they're so married to the storytelling form, into the language, into the convention, so to speak. Um, but yeah, new one, I can't say enough yeah. good things about. The old one and the new one as well, they're fantastic. Um, I was thinking more like Edward Hopper, you know, picking a frame before or after an action, mm -hmm. and so the reader mm -hmm. looks as to put together the story instead of showing this, just the story. And, and there, you know, there, stuff like that. There's that, like, great voyeuristic quality to Edward Hopper. He's, like, my favorite painter, actually. 
um, there's that great voyeuristic quality to his work because you feel like you're intruding on something and it, there's something kind of sneaky about his work. Uh, I know Dean's smiling. He's, he's getting ideas. No, you're just revealing yeah. things about yourself. I it? am totally <laughs> revealing things about myself, Dean. So that's, that's what, you know, you learn more about the interviewer than the interviewee. Um, so anyways, on to Bob Fingerman. Um, we have some pages up here from Minimum Wage. Um, so Bob, why, um, I can't really see them. So. No, they're, There's people. they're two pages, yeah. So, um, oh, it's the abortion one, another funny issue. <laughs> <laughs> we stick with the light stuff here, what can I say? Um, dropping babies in abortion. I will gladly drop a baby. <laughs> okay, so Bob, um, yes, they're actually these two pages right here. No, I, I okay. yeah, I can see one of them, so I think. Are they both from the same uh, thing? Yes. Oh, no, they, wait. One's from the comic convention issue, and one's yeah. from the abortion chapter. Yes, they are. Um, Comics and abortions. So anyways, uh, yeah, why have a cipher? Why have Rob rather than Bob Fingerman? Why do it semi-autobiographical? Well, because it's not pure autobiography. I, I, as, as narcissistic as doing this stuff is, I didn't want it to be that narcissistic, and I also didn't want it to be that revealing. If you dress it up as fiction, I could get enough truth in it to give it the kind of weight that I wanted it to have and protect my privacy to some degree. Mm -hmm. And it also gave me the latitude to make stuff up. You know, if you, I mean, all autobiography to a greater le or lesser degree is going to be everything. Is, I mean, it's all going to be through your perception. But if you're calling it autobiography, you're saying it's true. I can put fiction in this, and I don't have to say it's true. It's just, it should, it's like Stephen Colbert. It's, there's truthiness in this, but it's not true. Right. Um, yeah, I like that. Truthiness, I like that. I might steal that sometime. Um, From Colbert. It's, I guess, second degree stealing. Uh, so anyways, um, but one thing I, I am wondering is, um, how soon after the events that did happen in minimum wage, the ones that were based on fact, did you commit them to paper within the comic book? More than a decade. Okay. Uh, Peter Bagg had a really interesting saying. Uh, Peter Bagg did a comic book called Hate, which was semi-autobiographical. And he had this great saying where he said he basically waited 10 years until after something happened to document it in comics because he's like, at that point, you can kind of laugh at it. The wound isn't so fresh. Um, yeah, I, don't, I don't think, yeah, I don't think people, generally speaking, do their best work if they're writing about something that just happened. You know, oh, write yeah. it down and look at it later. Mm -hmm. I mean, no disrespect to well-intentioned things, but there were a whole spate of comics that came out after September 11th, and they're yeah. all shit because, you know, they're good intentions. They just weren't funny. But they weren't <laughs> funny, <laughs> but... Uh, <Okay. laughs> no, known as the unfunny panel. Thing. But, uh, you know, nobody, nobody had time to absorb it. It was yeah. too huge. I still haven't absorbed it, so I still don't think I would do good work about it. Um, so something, you know, something on a much smaller scale, uh, I do think you need a little perspective. I think perspective is always, you know, a helpful tool. Have you uh, gained any new perspective on uh, minimum wage since it was published? Yeah, which has also been a while. Well, actually, there's this new edition out, which I will pimp right now. This is the big giant edition. It's so big it shakes the table. Like, yeah, wow. <laughs> it's gorgeous. I did not realize it was that yeah. heavy. Um, but yeah, actually, in putting together this new edition, I've, I've been seriously thinking of coming back to the series and starting it up again. But again, since it's been more than 10 years since I stopped doing it, you know, that, that brings a whole different layer to the way I'd approach it now, so. Do you think it would be? <laughs> this is killing Dean here. No, I'm to so, oh, okay. so we can't be spontaneous. <laughs> I guess not, maybe we need to project. Okay, you're, are you, is Dean on? <laughs> Dean's on. Do you think this will be 10 years later, Bob, the series start? Mm -hmm. No, I, 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 the, the last chapter takes place in 1997, so I was thinking of popping it forward to 2000 and even maybe calling it minimum wage 2000 okay. with that retro futuristic sound. <laughs> <laughs> and we have jet cars. 
And uh, then let's move on to From the Ashes, which is your speculative memoir, which is about a post-apocalyptic America with yourself and your wife. Yeah, that one I used my real name and my real wife. <laughs> so what about it? Uh, well, why do it? <laughs> why do a speculative? I'm not used to being asked. Uh, why do it's a speculative memoir? Why not just have it be other characters? Why be you and your wife tromping through post-apocalyptic New York? Um, well, for a couple of reasons. One, um, I, at that point, I wanted to satirize the fact that so many books were coming out that were memoir comics. And I, again, I'm thinking, this is, this is, it is very narcissistic. And there was just one after the other after the other. And I thought, most people who draw comics don't really have fascinating lives, you know? <laughs> they sit around drawing comics. So I thought, right. let's at least give it an interesting backdrop. Let's blow the world up and then take, you know, this cartoonist and his wife through their paces in a, you know, mutant rich New York City. Uh, full of satire and mutants and zombies and um, yeah. all types of religious zealots. Yeah, and, and I'd also, like Bush was still in, in the White House, so Apocalypse was very much on my mind. Yeah. Um, so let's, let's move on to Dean real quick. Um, I want to make sure we all have time to converse. Uh, this is an in-progress panel from Street Code, right, yeah. Dean? Uh, which, now tell me about Street Code. Is it, would you consider it full autobio or semi-autobio? I, I, I think autobio is semi-autobio. That's how I feel. And the thing that was interesting about Street Code versus uh, this other character we can talk about briefly, which is Billy Dogma, is that I feel that there's a certain limitation to autobio and or semi-autobio in that you can only be a voyeur in my life. And I feel that that, you know, you have to either dig what I have to, you know, truck around or, you know, show and tell. Uh, and hopefully it's an interesting story versus some of the more boring memoirs and comics. Uh, but uh, I think the reason why I created uh, Billy Dogma was because I think you could insert yourself into that storyline because it isn't me. And just to correct something you said earlier about it, it's, it taps into the more universal truths, I'd say it taps more into the emotional truths of who, who I am. Because the other thing about autobio and or semi-autobio is that you have to adhere to certain chronology, uh, accountability, so that it feels and reads real. Uh, and I'm less interested in, in real when I'm more interested in the emotional truths of who we are. So. That's why um, I dabble in autobio because I feel like I've lived a, a semi-interesting life, and, and I only tell the stories that I believe are interesting. I'm not going to navel gaze, and you know, uh, I don't know. I feel like who who knows Joe Matt, the the cartoonist Joe Matt. I thought he was interesting for a while, and then it got really incredibly tedious his comics uh, because he just basically trapped himself into a room and watched porno all day and only edited together the cum shots, and then he would pee in a bottle in his closet. And I was like, why do I know this now? <laughs> and why is he living this life? Do, do you want to know that now? I, I, and now, now you know it, and I'm sorry. <laughs> but anyway, I, I felt like, you know, get outside, because especially when you live in a big city, something's bound to happen. My dad once said to me, uh, uh, oh, what was it? Something to the, to the effect of, uh, it has to do with time. Like, you know, a lot of things don't happen before midnight. And then he would come home at like two in the morning and he had this look on his face like something ill had gone down. And he wouldn't tell me <laughs> until later. You know, he did share a little too much information at times. But I thought that's what was interesting. It's like you can live in a big city and if you just show up to the party, you'd be surprised what happens sometimes. And the party is just a life, is what I'm talking about, not an actual party. Um, so that's what I'm interested in, in, in autobio or, or what I want to read, but more importantly, what I want to sit down and spend many hours drawing is hopefully something that you'll be interested in too. Yeah, I was going to say that, because um, I always have characters, I mean, they're very much me. I mean, heck, I look just like Paige. Like, oh, big surprise. Um, but I always say that, because my work is very personal, but I don't want people, I don't make it to help people understand me. I make work so they, there's room for them, so they, it can help them understand them, because I think that's what good auto bio -y stuff does. It's not about, oh, I want you to learn everything about my life. It's about, here's the truth that, you know, but there's room for them, you know. You know what I mean? 
and also what I find interesting in, in doing these kinds of comics is trying to find the voices. Uh, when I worked with Harvey Picar, one of the things I learned from him was that he had an ear for listening to other people talk. So actually what he was doing was observing in his comics. Or he was just obviously, you know, capturing different moments and then just, you know, parlaying them in, into his comics. And that was his commentary, was coming from the voices of the people. And I know that Bob had a really good cast of characters in his minimum wage comics. In fact, one of them is sitting in the audience as well, Doug Broad. And, you know, he would no, capture... Uh, oh, <laughs> abroad. Abroad, Doug Abroad. Abroad no. broad is sitting in the audience. Abroad <laughs> broad is sitting. But anyway, broad, I mean, the Bob Fingerman knows. But Bob always had a good ear. And, and if I may just go off for one second, I was reminded when Bob was just reading the script right now that he used to call me up back when people used phones to talk to each other. Um, <laughs> he would call me up, and, and he was cracking up over this uh, essay collection uh, called What's Not to Love by Jonathan Ames. And he would read me these short stories that would kill me. And one in particular was uh, I Shit My Pants in the South of France. Uh, the title alone was, was funny. And Bob would read this to me. And then one day, I, I, and you know, so you know, we'd have this once a week chat or whatever. And, and it was just lovely to hear his voice tell me stories. So I remember going to a local cafe in Brooklyn. And there's Jonathan Ames. And I felt like you know, I really knew this guy. And I said, I have to work with you. Eventually, we would. Yeah. Um, Thanks to Bob. Real, real quick, and, and I'm glad you mentioned Harvey. Um, and I, I put some American Splendor up, and I also have some more Billy Dogma. Um, when did you start Billy Dogma again? What year? I started Billy Dogma in 1995. I just wanted to have a character that spoke for me because I was, like I said, I was struggling with the idea of doing straight autobio. In fact, I never meant to do autobio. I always thought I would draw other people's stories, like Harvey Picar. Uh, but then I did this comic called Keyhole with a friend of mine named Josh Neufeld, who has done autobio and, and also told other people's stories, like Picar as well. And we always had a friendly um, camaraderie and competition where I used to joke I was a much better artist and a much better cartoonist than him. So if he was going to tackle autobio, then I was going to do autobio. And that's one of the reasons why I did it. Uh, what did you learn? Competition. Competition. Yeah, oh, keeps, okay. keeps things healthy. <laughs> what did you learn from Harvey that well, might have come back to your work on Billy. Oh, uh, Billy, probably not much, to be honest. More in the, in the autobio stuff. And it really was just having an ear open towards, you know, other people's stories and ideas. And, um, yeah, not, not that. There was actually the pencil uh, street code that you had. Yeah. I had this conversation right with here. my next-door neighbors, these two Asian girls, and I was having this friendly kind of, like, you know, parlay with them. And then I finally broke down and kind of said to this girl, like, I was really bummed out that my girlfriend broke up with me and all this stuff. And she looked at me. She was like, you, have a, you had a girlfriend? I was like, why? Why is that like, so difficult? She said, because you have two cats. I thought you were gay. <laughs> <laughs> so that's when you listen to other people and you get another story, you know, yeah, and you yeah. learn a little bit about yourself. Yeah. Um, well, real quick, and uh, then I want to move on to the other two guys. Um, Tell me about this story right here and uh, this was, the bar. Um, this was just a little story about one of my favorite bars in Brooklyn when I first uh, moved to Brooklyn about 16 years ago. And um, a friend of mine told me about this place, Montero Lounge, and he said it's the best bar in the world. And he had to take me to it. And we get there, it's empty, nothing's happening. The bartender's nice, and it's a really cool place. But I was like, why is this the best bar in the world? And he goes, don't worry. And it, like I was saying earlier, you just stick around, something's going to happen. And suddenly this guy walks in and looks like the unknown soldier from the hospital across the street. <laughs> and he just sits in the corner of the bar. And the bartender, d without skipping a beat in the middle of conversation with us, just walks over, kind of acknowledges him by putting a bottle and a whiskey shot, I mean, a, a shot glass on the, on the counter, and then walks back to us, you know, finishing the conversation. And she didn't even say one word to him. It was just like there was this pact, you know? Yeah. And I was like, this is the best bar in the world. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, let's move on to Ethan. Um, this, this is actually a scene from um, Tales set on the subway. Um, <clears throat> how did living, because you, you don't live in New York City anymore. No. You live in Ithaca? Yep, Ithaca, New York. So how did living in the city um, kind of, um, steer you in writing tales? How did that whole lifestyle affect how you approach the narrative? Oh, well, you know, the, I, I first started it after I quit college, and I just needed a, an avenue to kind of start publishing my, my work. And, you know, much like everyone here, I'm sure we found that, you know, we had a story to tell. Um, 
I was being a little self-indulgent, and I wanted to get even with an ex-girlfriend. <laughs> what better way than to publish a comic that 800 people will read? Comic book revenge. Yeah, it's like, yeah. Ha, everyone knows what a jerk yeah. you are now. <laughs> and um, yeah, at the time we were living in the city, my ex-girlfriend and I started fostering cats. And um, at one point for four months, we had fostered 15 cats. You're way gay. <laughs> oh, I'm Liberace gay. It, in the world of cat fostering. And um, <laughs> if you're looking for a really wonderful, unconventional way to add a lot of stress and destroy your sex life, foster 15 <laughs> cats. Because it is, like, the smell alone is just unimaginable. So what did you use for a litter pan? Or did you have several litter pans? Or did you just yeah. give up your bathtub? Uh, yeah. Uh, well, I was, I was still living with my parents. And luckily, we... Um, we actually had a, in, in the comic, um, I, I have it set in the Upper East Side, but we actually lived in Tribeca. There was um, subsidized housing around that time in the late 90s. So it was like a two bedroom apartment for $600, and it still is today. Wow. And uh, Julie McIntyre, for people who remember New Kids on the Block, uh, was my neighbor. I do. Yeah. <laughs> it was good. One time I saw him coming out of the elevator, and I was like, Julie! <laughs> I embarrassed. So why was he in subsidized housing if he was? Oh no, only twenty percent of it. Only twenty percent okay. of it was subsidized housing. I'm sorry. Okay. And so um, basically, um, I just uh, th there were little ads, tiny aspects of the city that I found really romantic, like a dirty subway or um, like a fire. <laughs> no, I, I, I wasn't being facetious. Like I, I really do find the uh, rats. the rats romantic, or just the. <laughs> You Sc Scorsese's New York you type thing. In the 70s, yeah. 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 Um, well, romance overload. <laughs> <laughs> um, just like a fire escapes. Just um, and so, I, I really wanted to capture what it was like um, living really broke, I guess, and yeah. uh, and I think I captured that. And uh, so. <laughs> well, you also you also deal a lot with being single in New York. Um, yeah, as, as I've I've read, yeah. how how much of um and, and you had a, actually when we when I first met you and we were talking about the book, um y you didn't really like when people were like God Ethan's such an asshole because Ethan not this Ethan but the character comic version of oh Ethan. yeah well before it was a web comic it was actually a, uh, a mini series back in '05 and I had just broken up with my girlfriend Cynthia right when the first issue came out. And I had all these grand plans for what to do with the story next, and all of a sudden I was writing like a, a tragic death scene with a giant Mack truck. <laughs> and not that I would do that, but um, right. a after a couple of years of reflection, Mack trucks are hard to get a hold of. So. Yeah, I realized what an asshole of a boyfriend I actually was, which I think all people people should reflect upon themselves. And so that's when I redid the comic a little bit, and uh, especially when you put it on the web one page at a time, people are just really impatient, and uh, they tell you you're an asshole. And it's a little surreal because it's almost like eavesdropping on your friends in a high school bathroom? Back when you were in high school, not that I do that now. But, you know, <laughs> or not much. But <laughs> Chris still <Right>. does. <laughs> Dude, you were the awesomest interview ever. <laughs> I, I could, I look young. Not that I knew that so so we, we've had dropped babies, bathroom conversations. Yeah, anyways. Uh, so what was the question? I, uh, I honestly I, I don't know. I totally forgot. Uh, you you kind of lost me there. but so, Something uh, about being single. Oh, yeah. Right, just, right. And being I, an asshole in the comments. Yeah, I remember um, you were my editor, and uh, Daniel Herman from Hermes Press was really concerned no one would buy this book because yeah. Ethan is such an asshole. <laughs> and that's all I kept hearing. <laughs> Ethan is such an asshole. No one's going to buy this book. And I said, thank you. Yeah, I'm not saying anything. Uh, so, so, um, so, assholiness aside, um, the the book is more about just being an asshole and dating in New York. It it takes a bit of a, an odd, fantastic twist. And uh, actually, I apologize. I don't have more pages up right now. Oh. Um, but Ethan draws this comic Crusader Cat, and eventually things get really weird. I don't know if I want to spoil too much, but but why introduce such a fantastic element into a, a pretty heavily semi autobiographical work? Um, I think it's because I met my future wife and I was really happy, so there was really no more angst for me to really um, uh, focus on. Um, so I decided, well, I could explore that angst and that insecurity in a more metaphorical way through a creation within a creation. And uh, I also wanted to, I guess, um, comment on how interconnected we are with our creations, I suppose. Because mm -hmm. um, Crusader Cat's life is... Uh, even though he's a super cat in anthropom anthropomorphic world. And he's very cute. He's Not adorable. To, yeah. He's, yeah. You want to just like. Yeah. Much like his creator. It's a swoof. Devilishly <laughs> handsome. Uh, 
Um, I'm kidding. It's, uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So you know, it's um, it's also I just I have a proclivity for drawing superheroes and uh, a, a strong affinity for superheroes, even though I do a semi-autobiographical book. So I wanted to kind of fuse the two and probably make it. Um, I wanted to make the book a little bit more unique. Uh, but then it also came out around the same time that a lot of Asian cartoonists started putting out semi-autobiographical <laughs> work with a Wait, fantasy. you're Asian? I think so. Wow. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, well, what else was coming out at that time? American-born Chinese. Which uh, is, yeah, semi-autobiographical. Scott Pilgrim. With, uh, Scott Pilgrim. Although he's, he's white in, in the comic, or raceless. Yeah, I think he's just kind of... Kind of but it, it's, it's very similar, though, in tone. Yeah, yeah. and um, I think... Uh, what else came out? Uh, Fred Chow's um, Johnny Hero came out as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, Derek Kirk Kim's tune just came out. And when I met Derek, I actually said to him, people are going to accuse me of plagiarism because it is about a college dropout who becomes an artist. And there's a fantasy element thrown in in the third act. And we had a little laugh about it. Yeah. Um, real quick, and I want to move on and just ask you guys about the internet and autobiographical comics, um, you know, and how it has affected how you approach autobiographical and how you deal with the slings and arrows of the comments field, which I know, Dean, you've dealt a lot with that on Activate primarily and, and perhaps Trip City as well. I, I welcome it. I mean, you know, I think you put yourself out there. You got to, you know, uh, take it, too. Um, but weirdly enough, I become less interested in doing autobio because of social networking. I feel like in a way I'm doing autobio through my social networking, maybe not necessarily with drawing, but with you know posting a comment or whatever. And I'm also curating a, a sensibility of who I am by who I share and like. You know, it's not just a me, me, me world. What becomes me are the things that I like and the people I pimp and dig and what and events I go to. And you know, we live in a world where. You know, everything is an image now. I, I think it was Seth Kushner, who you partnered with on uh, Leaping Tall Buildings, yeah. that told me, he's a photographer, that told me that in, uh, out of all, 10% uh, of all the pictures ever taken were in 2011. <laughs> 2011, all, all the bit ever taken in the world, you know, since the invention of photography. 10% of that's happened in 2011, which is sick. You know, you think yeah. about it. Because everyone just snaps and, you know, from their phones or whatnot and dumps it online and there's no editing, there's no scrutiny, there's nothing. And I think, in a way, we've all become, if anybody who's in social networking is doing semi autobio comics in some weird fashion. Uh, so I've become less interested because we're all, you know, sharing these experiences in some way. Mm -hmm. It's let, you know, unless, you know, I don't know, some, you had some extraordinary experience that you want to talk about, uh, you know, there's no reason for it. We're, we're living yeah. it every day. We're showing it, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, Laura Lee, you've had a pretty active online presence. Oh, which yeah. mic? So many you mics. You could be in stereo. Oh, goodness. Um, well, for, I started sharing my work in 2002, back, no, 2003, back on MySpace, that dates me. <laughs> um, and for years, I would put up like just my, my, my artwork and my little comics, my little illustrations. And actually, and, and it sort of weirded me out to do stuff that was very personal, because then people would meet me at a show or something, and it's like they would like, oh, so th this is going on with you. And I'm like, oh, gosh, how do they know that? And, it's, and it made me feel like the people were getting to know a version of me that was different from actual me. And so it definitely forced me to evolve my art so it was less, so I got more into like the fantasy elements and metaphors, so stuff that was, so I would take my idea and I would just boil it down to like, okay, well, instead of showing this specific scene of this is what happened, well, what is it really about? And so I'll boil it down so you can't tell what the actual situation was or who the actual people, but the still, the idea that the core of it was still there. So I kind of just thought, I just used it, like I couldn't deal with, you know, people and the judgment, so I just boiled it down to something more abstract so then they could interpret it how they wanted. So then it was not about me at all. <laughs> so, but it was weird, the more I made it personal, then like, you know, really vulnerable, but more just abstract and people connected better, like, which seems, up, yeah, contradiction. Yeah, and, uh, and Bob, since, I mean, minimum wage, you, you don't really have a huge online presence, do you? I mean, I, you have BobFingerman.com, but yeah, you usually just do your work the, 
the way it should be done. Just you draw it. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm old fashioned. I haven't really embraced the internet. <laughs> I'm waiting for the next development. You know, there's yeah. bound to be something. This is just strictly a beta thing. The whole, yeah. the whole web. It'll yeah, pass. It's, it's it's all a phase. Um, so so uh, with minimum wage, I mean, did you find people's expectations of you after reading the comic were colored in a certain way, or they had certain thoughts of how what type of personality you would have in real life? Uh, I mean, they basically just. Had I mean he's just a younger, more immature, so you know they I guess I don't know they just get the slightly older version. I'm not quite as uh, easily riled up as the character, but uh, or as strident I like to think. <laughs> um, but that's not really an, an interwebs question. So I don't know. People meet me, they get what they get. You know, yeah. nobody's surprised. They get a bob. Nobody's ever surprised. <laughs> I was surprised. They used to say you're younger than I thought, but they don't say that anymore. Oh, <laughs> I'm sorry, man. Maybe it's because your audience is getting. I don't. I don't know. I remember when um, I was reading Minimum Wage, and there was like a picture of Bob Fingerman, and it didn't look like Rob in the comic. And I was like, damn, he looks. Like a hard motherfucker, you know? Like, <laughs> <laughs> And then we kind of, I guess, emailed each other, and then we were going to meet at, Jessica Abel was in town, and we were going to meet at some club or something, and that That's didn't right. work out. And so we met at another, play, another time, and I was like, after talking for five minutes, I was like, that's just like the dude in the comic. <laughs> <laughs> so he looked like, you know, like someone that was kind of, you know, like a, a movie character, you well, know? We're, yeah. If we're going to hash up that whole thing, I, yeah. as, I, as I recall, you sent me to some club that you weren't at, and this is in the pre-cell <laughs> phone days, and I thought you were a total piece of shit for That's setting right. me up. That's right. So by the time you met me, I was hugely pissed off. <laughs> <laughs> and there you go. I, I don't go to clubs. my character, because I was like, you're on well, the nice, buddy. Like, uh, <laughs> I, 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 I give a character about you. Have you. A cell phone <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I wish I wish we could go back to like just soup cans on a wire sometimes. But then, but but then what happened is we, we got friendly and uh, and then I used to tell this story about my roommate and, and Bob basically invited me to draw and write it as a backup in, in minimum wage. So you know, the, the relationship encouraged more autobile or semi autobile. Well, I remember I mean I first met your work when I was staying at Dean's my first time in Brooklyn. I, I came down to interview Dean for a book. 06, I think, mm -hmm. 07. And uh, it was winter, and I remember I had some time to kill, and you just shoved back the question to me. And, mm -hmm. and I was like, I got to meet Bob. Mm -hmm. um, now, what about you, Ethan? Uh, since you've been pretty constant online for a while, um, have you had people you know, assume they know you because of the strip? And have, has the comments field in your, because you have a pretty strong readership. Yeah, not super strong, but I I would say it's it's there. Um, it's, uh, some people read it, so <laughs> they'll say he's an asshole. <laughs> yeah, well, 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 yeah, he treats but, women horribly. <laughs> not that horribly, but uh, I'm not going to defend <laughs> myself anymore. Um, yeah, I, I I find that um, the more I post and the more I blog and the more I comment and communicate with them, they at uh, readers see me as a little bit more affable and approachable. And uh, one reader actually one time uh, went the extra mile to actually like congratulate me almost on pat me on the back and say, you're the only web creator I know who takes his time to answer every single comment and respond to them. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I think that's helped me a long way, especially since you know I debuted it as a, I, I debuted, sorry. I debuted Tales as a web series in 09, and the first book didn't come out till late 2012. That mm -hmm. there was still a group of readers who stuck with it for all those years and decided to support me, and um, yeah. So yeah. And, and one thing I I feel so bad. The first time I met Ethan, I was in the studio building in Gowanus where Dean is, and Laura Lee and I were in a studio together, and um, I was doing Graphic NYC, uh, the blog website that. Uh, became the book Leaping Tall Buildings with Seth Kushner, who's the reason it's so damn pretty. Um, I just did the words. But Ethan asked us to review Tales, but he sent a very polite email, which when you're like, when you do a website that features reviews, there's kind of, it's very rare you have someone actually send you a very nice, courteous email. It's usually a sense of entitlement that, that I've received from some web cartoonist who shall remain nameless. Um, so, so we reviewed, I had someone review the strip and we just kept in touch. He came to see me at the studio one day 
And it was the day that I had the worst time getting my fridge replaced in my new apartment. Yeah. And at one point, our landlord had sent some drunk guy over to fix it. I think that was the drunk guy day. I'm drunk not Drunk sure. guy day, yeah. But I yeah, that. I had to ditch poor, poor Ethan in Dean's studio, and uh, he never came out the same. I, I don't know what <laughs> I think what Dean was like, Dean, who the hell Dean is this guy sitting I, in my studio? I don't know, but... But yeah, so <laughs> anyways, uh, on that note, I want to wrap up so you guys can have time to uh, chat with everyone and get some books signed. Um, Tales Book One is currently out by Hermes Press. Uh, we have some copies here uh, donated by Mr. Ethan Young. Um, when is volume two due out? Um, I believe it's, it's probably out sometime later this year. I, I would say um, uh, fall, but don't, don't count on it. Uh, it's probably late winter. Okay. Yeah, well, it's been edited. I know that much. Yes. <laughs> what about Will and Wit? I know that's due on May 7th. Um, tell us about the publisher and what you have planned for it. Uh, yes, it comes out in May through Abrams Books, their young adult division amulet. Even though I like to write stuff for grown-ups, but they're just younger because they don't like to talk down and, you know, to them. Um, and actually, I think the launch party, I'm emailing Housing Works about having the launch party here. May 9th. May 9th. Mark the date. Wait, I think we're at May 15th. Like a week after. Try for a newsletter. Stay tuned. Yes. But actually, I'm working with uh, my artner, uh, Lauren Larkin, because I have artners. Um, what? What? <laughs> they're artners. They're, it, you make, it, well, when I have friends, I just want to take things to the next level by making art with them. You know, that's how I take it to the next level. I like it. Uh, so I call them my partners instead of partners. Um, but he, she's a songwriter, and uh, she, I met her when I was doing my sketchbook project, doing basically a page every other day, and she was doing a song every day, and it was just like instant friends, because it's just so hard. And anyway, but we're turning the second book into a musical, which is very exciting. So for the book launch, we're going to have some of the songs ready in time to perform. So that's cool. exciting. Yeah. So, yay! Fantastic. Um, and when is Maximum Minimum Wage coming out, Bob? And what can you tell us about this <clears throat> awesome brick of an edition coming out from Image? Uh, March 20th. So, this month. Wow. That's soon. Uh, I, I, yeah, I know, uh, I don't know if it's, is this bad? I'll be doing a signing at Forbidden Planet for that. So, sorry, Housing Works. But uh, <laughs> it, it's, it's a comic shop. So, you know, it's, yeah. it's appropriate. Um, and what about it? It's big, you know. <laughs> it's it's like the, hun the honeycomb of of, of uh, minimum wage. It's got everything. I mean, it's it's got all of the comics, uh, all of the covers. It's a nice color section. It's got a huge guest gallery of artists, including Dean, uh, and a bunch of other people. And it has the script for that issue. I mean, it's 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 almost 400 pages. So it's a pretty loaded loaded volume and it's pretty and, and it's big and, and this is a the I art mean, actually has some cha has some room to breathe i always thought it was printed a little small because it's a pretty it's pretty dense art so yeah. it's nice that it's bigger yeah and it's uh th his copy has this wonderful new book smell so it's an olfactory experience um and finally dean uh you are curating tripcity.net with seth kushner and a gazillion other guys it's really, it's just, uh, it was an evolution from Activate. Activate is a web comics collective that I launched in 2006 with a few other people. And that uh, basically it was an idea to kind of take a no permissions, no apologies policy towards making your own comics. I would spend too much, too much of my time waiting for an editor, an art director, a publisher to acknowledge that I had pitched something or was seeking work. And what I discovered uh, by using the internet was that this was a way to put up stuff and uh, it was kind of like this online resume to be making comics, to putting up comics, and the kind of comics you wanted to write and draw. So I used Activate as that place. Um, it was, you know, it was working for me while I slept. Uh, then eventually I discovered, wow, I like things beyond comics as well. I like to write. I like movies. I like all, you know, I like doing interviews. And then, you know, I was listening to Mark Maron's WTF podcast, so we started to do a podcast. And we needed a multi, I wanted a multimedia website, so that's what Trip City is uh, that I do, uh, curate with Seth Kushner, Chris Miskevich, and Jeffrey Burant, and uh, Hannah Mean Shannon as well. So, 
Uh, and then we, we get a lot of cool folks uh, doing really interesting stuff up there. And I'm learning more about uh, the internet through uh, doing a website because of the attention span of people. Uh, I've discovered that you need to do more bite-sized things uh, versus anything substantial because of people's attention span. Because we've leveled the playing field online and everyone's being pulled left and right all the time. So you can give you know something like a minute or two towards something and then something else is catching your attention. So it's interesting time right now. What about comics beyond Trip City? Do you have anything you can announce? Uh, gosh, uh, I'm doing a lot of couple of little things. Uh, um, uh, I can't really announce anything. I don't okay. think. Sorry. But check out tripcity.net. Stay tuned. Um, so, anyways, uh, I'm gonna let everyone go here, but uh, so you can buy lots of books and have them signed. Um, we have a, a ton of stuff over here. Um, several DC Comics um, provided uh, some of the American Splendors that Dean drew. Um, we have the Quitter, I believe. Quitter, Do we have the Quitter? Um, Cuba, My Revolution, and uh, the book that uh, Chris uh, and I did, uh, which is yeah. Dean Haspiel, The Early yes. Years, because I have an early years. With, with Seth Kushner, yes, he has an early years. And, um, and actually, the, the, the Dean book uh, features a lot of his autobio stuff. Um, it's kind of... It, sandwiched in with essays that I wrote that bridge an autobiographical story to another one, not in the order they were, were right. created, but in the order in which they actually happened to Dean. So you can read it from cover to cover and get the whole Dean Haspiel early years experience. Um, we have copies of Page by Page. Um, we have copies of Tales. Um, I also have a book on Peter Bag that I did a few years ago. Uh, a couple copies of Leaping Tall Buildings. Uh, we have some copies of Beg the Question. So unless you want to really hold out and get the maximum minimum wage director's cut fantastic galore thing, just two weeks. You got two weeks to hold out. So you can look at Beg the Question and that'll give you an indication of, of what you're going to get here. So I like Beg the Question. Hey, Beg the Question's great. It's my first first Bob. So it's in here. This is better. Yeah, it, this is bigger. So anyways, uh, Arthur, do, I, do you want to? Do some quick audience questions for about five minutes. Does anyone have any questions? Oh, wait, one question. Yes, ma'am. Do you want to quickly, uh, the Zera grant was a grant that, uh, how many years did that go for? Like 15 years maybe? 20 years? I, I knew a lot of people that got the Zera grant and what it did is it, uh, you would kind of create a publishing plan for your comic, you send it in and the Zera grant was uh, created by Peter Laird of uh, one of the guys who uh, co-created Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And I think because he was so successful, he wanted to give something back to the community. And it was through this Zerk grant. Uh, and I think they would pick like between five and seven people every season, it might have been twice a year or something like that. And you would get this self-published comic. Uh, it never really, I don't think it paid the person to create the comic, it basically paid for the publishing and to get it distri distributed and stuff. And it was a really great model and a lot of people vied for it and I knew a lot of people got it. I think it's a great thing. Uh, I did hear that it ended. I didn't really know the reason since I never tried for a zero grant myself. Uh, and do I think it's wrong or something or bad or good? Um, you know, it's a sign of the times. I was actually surprised that it lasted that long. I don't know how it funded itself unless it just came from revenues from the guy's, you know, wallet or something, you know? So I can't blame, you know, after a while you're like, okay, I did that. I, you know, that's truly altruistic, you know, to do that. Uh, so, um, but you know, I also think that, that you know it is a sign of the times that there there are Kickstarters, there is web comics. I mean, whenever whenever anyone asks me, how would I, you know, as a new cartoonist, what what should I do, Dean? I was like, the internet's right in front of you, you know, and if if, if you social network at all, you know, be part of something, be part of a community, you know. Um, yes, it takes a little while, you know, and be interested in other people's stuff and show up to the, you know, little signings and conventions and things like this, and you'll meet other people who do what you do, uh, and I think that's what's really important. 
Um, but yeah, I think, do we need to have that? It was cool to have. I'm sorry it's not there, but I also don't you know, begrudge them for stopping it either. I definitely looked into it back in the day, but now there's a Kickstarter. Amanda Palmer lays it all out. Yeah, yeah, and an amazing <laughs> TED Talk. Um, and, and we have, uh, Amanda Palmer did a TED Talk this week. Uh, Amanda Palmer, the musician of the Dresden Dolls and um, Neil Gaiman's wife, incidentally. Um, She's so cool. She's an amazing performance artist, and she actually talks about how she was able to have people start, she would give content out away for free, but people would still pay her. Um, and how it can involve the audience. Well, it's about community, like what Dean was yeah. saying. Yeah, but, gran yeah. but granted, Amanda Palmer also had um, several years where she busted her ass with the Dresden Dolls as a performance artist and created those relationships. Um, but but that's, it's a fascinating talk. Also, uh, Jimmy Palmiotti is uh, a writer, inker, is a maestro when it comes to Kickstarter. I don't know how many books he's he's kickstarted at this point. Successfully. Success. Yeah. I mean, really. Like this this dude has it. I talked with him for the Drawn Word number two, which is a free download if you guys are into it. Um, and he's got it down to a science. Like it's it's ridiculous how good this guy is. With Speaking earlier about uh, Mark Maron's WTF podcast, I listened to an interview he did with Chris Rock, and they were talking about something. And, it, and at some point. They talk about fame and how, how would you become famous today as a comedian. And he said, back when he became famous, like 20 some odd years ago, there were 12 channels on you know on TV and cable, and you had to appeal to millions of people in order to just m get a break. He said, what's interesting today is you need probably like a real secure fan base of about 5,000 people in order to survive. You know, maybe you're not going to get a yacht, but you can survive on your art or your or the, whatever it is you want to do. Uh, if you charge accordingly, you know? Yeah, and uh, well, I think we should probably wrap things up then. Um, remember, all, uh, all sales uh, benefit Housing Works, um, so please buy lots of stuff. And these guys will sign it. Uh, if you want any of mine, I'll sign it too. Okay, thank you everyone else, and please give everyone here an, a round of applause. They were great.